Hi there, I'm Janet Haynes and I have been an ambassador for Permajet for quite a few years, but I'm missing doing printing because obviously in this strange times we're not using as much paper and print as we were. And personally, from my point of view, a photograph is never complete unless it's printed. So what I would like to do today is to try and talk you through printing and get you to enjoy the pleasure that I get from printing and to engage with you in such a way that you feel it's an easy thing to do because I know a lot of people find it quite difficult and quite daunting to go through all the processes. So in this talk I aim to try and make it simple for you so that you can get the pleasure that I get. So treat yourself to print. My guru and my mentor is Lee Preston and he's going to join me later in this session to talk to you about an offer that we're going to make to you at the end of the day. But what happened for me was Lee was very instrumental. I was printing moderately comfortably, not particularly well, but averagely well. And I went along to an RPS assessment day and no, an advisory day it was. And Lee looked at my work and, and it was, Janet, you can do better. A, you need to get off of a lustre paper and you need to put your work because your work lives on art paper. So you need to learn to do these things. So I started to think about, OK, I do want to look at print properly and I do want to enjoy printing. So what I want to do is to take you through a little bit through my journey and to understand that to get good results is not difficult. Um, I think in the early days, I listened to other people telling me colour management and, and it was so complicated. And I thought, oh, I, I really can't do that. So I'm going to do it in a simple way because ultimately I learned there was no magic bullet. It is simple and you just have to follow, follow the, the route, the rules. And you get there. You don't need to understand all the, all the details that the guys seem to want, to want me to learn. So it's pleasure, not pain. It's really important that to achieve a perfect print, you need to go through given steps, which are really easy to do, and keep that workflow working in the right way. And then out the other end comes your beautiful print. So let me let me make it easy for you and let's look at what those steps are. First of all, your camera settings. It starts at that stage. If you have the ability on your camera to use RAW, then please take advantage of it. If you think back to the days of when we had film, you didn't expect a film, other than when we were doing Polaroids, of course, but you didn't expect your picture to come out of your camera instantly. You knew you were going to get a negative and that was going to have to be processed. And really, your raw is your negative. So it gives you the maximum amount of opportunity to collect data accurately. You need to get your camera settings right, of course, but you can keep all that data as a raw negative. Think of that as the negative. And also to get the process working all in the same colour space and colour spaces, don't get worried about the word colour space because it's nothing more than um, a shape of colour, if you like, all the colour, all the colours of the rainbow in inner shape. And if you can set your camera to Adobe RGB, then we can work through the process, the whole workflow, keeping a constant of that colour space. So I recommend you say to set your camera for Adobe RGB and if possible, use RAW. So RAW conversion, it comes up into the software and you do need to learn how to use that accurately. It really is quite important that um, you learn those skills, but you can do it from a tutorial on YouTube. You don't have to sort of worry about how am I going to learn. Use the sliders in the raw conversion in moderation. People have a tendency to wing them up one way or wing them down the other way. 
And you can start to set process problems in train at that point in time. So take it as far as you think you need to and then pull it back a tad. You know, just just moderate your thoughts slightly and keep it moderate rather than extreme. In all honesty, you don't need, in my opinion, if you've got a decent camera and a reasonably decent lens, you don't need to be sharpening your images. If you start to sharpen images, you start to introduce potential for um, haloing, for example. That's the very common one that we see. And you can bring in other artifacts and things if you do this over sharpening. So a digital camera and a decent lens is good enough and you do not need to sharpen. I just do not remember when I last sharpened an image. So think about that. Just mind that er that potential error of bringing in artifacts from overprocessing at this stage. So having got your image on the screen, one of the things that we really need to consider is the monitor and this funny word calibration, which you'll have all gone, ooh, not sure about that, what do we do? Um, the monitor, I would say, buy the best you can afford, okay? I have an iMac and the reality is it's too bright. It's a beautiful screen, but it's overly bright. So you need to take that brightness down a little bit because otherwise the work that you're going to be doing is going to look really brilliant on the screen and then come out not so good on the print. So I have my brightness settings pulled back a little bit. PC screen, I'm not so sure about, but you can do that experimentation yourself as to whether your screen is overly bright. Think about the environment that you're, that you're working in. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but you can carry color in the eye. So if, for example, your screen is set up and the wall behind it is red, you are going to be seeing your images on your screen with some of that red getting worked through into the image. So I, <laughs> when we're decorating a room, the, the wall that goes behind my screen will be a mid-gray tone for the very reason that I'm not going to get any distractions when I'm processing. At the moment, I've got a creamy white wall behind there. It's not too bad at that one, but as soon as we decorate that room, it's going gray again. So think about your environment because it can impact on you. Try to process your work at the same time of day so that you're getting more or less the same light in the situation that you're um, at your screen. I choose to do my processing the, in the evening. So therefore, when I'm doing my calibration, I will calibrate my monitor in the evening. So calibration, it needs to be done regularly. And what it is doing is it's effectively correcting the, the settings in the computer and bringing them back so that it, it manipulates the data, if you like, to bring it back into balance. And all that I do is I have a thing called a spider and you can get lots of different makes. I'm not saying that the spider is the best one. I happen to just have this one and it isn't even, my one isn't even that old. Um, you know, I, I don't keep up to date with the very latest, but I do use it regularly. And that's the important thing. I need to be doing this about once a month or once every two months at the maximum, because what happens to screens is they drift out of colour. And oddly enough, when you're running the spider calibration, and I'll just show you a little bit more about that in a minute, at the end of the of the software, it actually allows you to flick between the screens, a before and after, and you will be surprised at how that changes. So all that you do is with this spider thing, is you literally hang it on the screen. You obviously you've got to load the software on first. You hang it on the screen, okay? And then it sits there on the screen and then it goes through all the colors and blacks and whites etc measuring everything and as it's doing it and you can see it in the in the shot a little light flicks on and off 
just flicks on and off. And it's important at this point in time to be calibrating, as I say, at the time of day that you're likely to process. But I also make sure, damn sure, that nobody comes in and opens doors and windows or curtains or whatever else or puts the electric light on. If they do, you've got to stop and start again. Um, it needs to be just left quietly to, to do its stuff. It only takes a few minutes. It's very, very easy. And the software talks you through it. So you can't actually go very far wrong with that. So having got everything, your monitor calibrated, um, it asks you at the end of the software how often you want to do it. And as I say, I would do mine once a month, every other month at the very least. Also, I will sometimes calibrate if I'm going to be printing something for an exhibition, for example, and I want to make sure I've got absolutely everything right. I will calibrate before I start doing the work. But that probably goes a little bit further than you actually need to on a day to day basis. So we fixed what we, how we um, produce the work, RGB. We fixed the monitor and now we're going to start to look at the printer. Obviously, it's quite key because um, you do need to have a printer that is going to give you enough colour inks to give you a nice smooth colour gradation on the final print. What you can see here is the cartridges for my Epson P600. So from looking in from the right on that row of cartridges, you can see that there is what's called a PK and an MK. So that's a, an ink that is for gloss paper, MK an ink that's for matte paper. Then there's two lighter greys, so they're grey blacks. Then it comes to the colours along, along the left-hand side. The fact that this printer has got these beautiful gradations of four colour blacks, if you like, grey to black, and it switches depending on the type of paper I'm using between the matte and the, uh, and the glossy, it means that at any given time I'm using three inks to print my work, depending which paper I'm using. And that really is quite key to getting a good print out the other end. So if you've got the type of printer that has blocks of, of ink, not only do you waste a lot because you'll probably find the yellow empties and you've now got a cartridge with three or four cartridge, uh, cartridges still full, but you've got to buy a new one because yellow's run out. Um, so not only does it do that, but in fact, at the end of the day, it works out more economical because you've only got to replace the one that needs, needs replacing at any given time. These days, if I had to replace my P600, my Epson printer, I would seriously look at the Canon printers. Now, please understand, Permajet don't pay me to do this. Um, I have a nice relationship with Permajet, and when I came up with the idea of this new talk that I wanted to give to camera clubs, that I sort of told them about the idea and said, look, can you cooperate with me here a bit? Because I could do with a bit of help. And so I'm working with them today to produce this video, but at the same time, um, I'm not, I don't benefit from anything that they buy from you or you buy from them. But what I would say is I would seriously, and I do mean that, look at the Canon printers if I was about to change. And on the Permajet website, you can find they have a YouTube video for you to look. And it explains to you about the range and which does what fundamentally. But what I... Um, talking to Permajet managed to do for you is give you the opportunity to buy a new really nice printer, the Canon Pro 300. And along with that, you will get a free pack of art paper at A3. And you will also get something we'll come on to talk about in a minute, which is a sample pack of papers, which I'm recommending that you have a go on. So it, it is a good buy. Yes, £699 goes, oh, I don't know if I want to pay that. But I'd ask you two, two questions. How much do you pay for your lenses and your camera? A lot of money. So 
why shirk when it comes to the output? Because a good camera is only any good as the results that you're going to get. And a decent image has to be printed. Why would you ever not print? You don't expect to go into an art gallery and see art that isn't printed or that isn't the original at the very best. You would like to see the original, but you might accept a reproduction that's printed. So why would you only look at photographs on a screen in your cam in your home when you can share your work and give it a much better look and quality by printing it? So the second reason I'd say treat yourself to a new printer is what else are we spending our money on right now? We've been locked up for all this length of time. Okay, we've probably done a lot of Amazon shopping or, or whatever, um, but nevertheless, we missed treating ourselves. And I'm saying to you, now's the time to treat yourself. You deserve it. We're going to be back at camera clubs. We're going to be back doing exhibitions. Get a decent printer and get yourself going before you get back to camera club and wow them all when you get back. So there's your special offer. So just to recap, what we're saying here is shoot in RAW, use Adobe RGB in your camera, look, buy a good monitor and make it sure it's not too bright, calibrate regularly. Now we're going to go on to choosing decent papers and quality inks. So let's have a little look at this next section. Because for me, that's what we've done so far is the hard work is the basic stuff that we've got to get right, but now we're getting on to the bit where the fun starts. And you can start to make your image look different. So without any disrespect to camera people, camera clubs, many, many people use luster papers, and there's a perfectly good one in Permajet, and if that's what you want to stick with, fine but work deserves to be printed on paper that makes a difference. And we'll come on to how you choose those papers in a minute. And some of the ones, I'll show you some of the ones that demonstrate the differences between these things. But we want your work or you want your work to be admired by others. It, you know, you feel good when you see your work on a wall in, in an exhibition or whatever or a friend comes in and you've got them on your own wall at home and they admire them. It does us good, it does all of us good to, to have that admiration. So give prints to family and friends, they love them. Great way to do Christmas presents. I've also made Christmas presents of coasters and things like that of my images. So use your images and get them out there, get people enjoying them. And when you get back to Camera Club, They'll all be stunned because you'll have moved up a step and they'll still be sat where they were before they went into lockdown. And uh, you'll be able to say, well, I've got on and I've learned how to print and I've got these beautiful results. And then when you're doing things like PAGB and RPS distinctions, you will have prints that will pass, basically. They will give you that extra edge in achieving any of those things, which you may or may not aspire to, I accept. So how to choose the papers? Because it is daunting. There are so many, and I'll show you the uh, range in a moment. I personally think that you need three, max four papers, because the better you can get to know them and understand them, the better your results will be. When I am processing something these days, I start to think about which paper I'm going to put it on. I start to get excited at that stage because I look forward to seeing my print come out of that printer and I want to be able to hold it and know that it's on the right paper. If that comes with a little bit of experience, I accept, but there are certain things that hint to us and as I say, I'll show you some in a moment that hint to us which paper they should be on. If you get to know that paper, you will process your work very subtly differently. And particularly, you will process it differently to how you will if it's going to be um, images for screen on, an, on a laptop somewhere 
projected at com Camera Club, whatever we like to think of it, if it remains as a digital image, it, you will never finesse it to the degree that you will and you will enjoy um, once you start using paper and decent paper at that. So I just want you to think about this. This is another quote from Lee. If you read the E! News, the PAGB E! News just recently, you'll have seen an article from Lee. And this was one of the statements that I read in there and I felt it was very pertinent. The visual language of a picture can alter with paper depending on the hue of the white base, its apparent brilliance and the texture. Take this next image, for example, because here is something produced A, colour, and B is a mono. I would produce those slightly differently and I would put them on different papers. So I'm already beginning to show you now how you start to decide which paper it's going to go on. This particular image for me, I produced it as the colour. I, I would consider myself a colour worker primarily. Um, so to produce it as a mono came as a shock to me. And then I thought, yes, but that's OK, because in reality, I wouldn't put it on the same paper. So I will bring it to life by putting it on a different paper. What paper is the question that we always get? And I, as I said just now, I do understand it's daunting. These are the digital papers that are available from Permajet. And as you can see now, there's, it's very, very difficult for us to show you um, the paper ranges here because trying to show the differences, I can see that there's a little bit of colour degradation going on in there because we're using Zoom and it's difficult to photograph something that is so delicate. So what I would recommend to you is rather than try and choose the paper looking at this, this particular demonstration, is that you contact Permajet and they'll send you a swatch of all their papers and then you can see, feel, touch, consider them properly. And they've got uh, the Brata range, which is fantastic, really great paper. This is um, quality paper. And once you get into printing, then you do find yourself wanting to go on to these better quality in papers. So. That's that range. And then there is the art range. This is quite popular um, and I like it particularly because of the type of work I do. So my very, very favourite paper is Portrait White. That one to me is a must in anybody's, anybody's selection because it's quite versatile and it is a beautiful paper to print on, perfect paper to print on. That's not to say that the others haven't got the right place um, and the right opportunity for you to use. So if you wanted something that's a heavier texture, there's plenty of them in the range there, as you can see. Whereas the portrait white has a very delicate texture on it and it's particularly white. So therefore for portraits and things like that, um, it really pays to have those particular image, that particular paper in your cupboard. To help you decide about papers, Permajet have put together this, the knowledge, and it's well worth just going onto their website. You've got to register and then they send it to you as a PDF, I think it comes through. And um, you can then work through what might work for you. However, what I've got here, it's a bit like doing a cake thing here. Here's one I did earlier. <laughs> so I want to show you some images and how different they can look from one paper to another. So an image that if you've seen any of my previous talks, you may well remember. This one is called, the title of this one is The Entrance of the Queen of Sheba. Here it's printed, and if I move it in the light, I think you'll probably be able to see, on titanium glossy. It's a lovely, lovely paper. And because of the gold wings here, it looks really quite nice on that particular paper. However, that one is part of an FRPS panel. 
So it's got to sit alongside another 19 images. So I have to choose one paper that is going to work across that entire panel. So where that one may look really brilliant on that paper, all the other 19 may not suit that paper. So I then have to consider, OK, what paper am I going to use for this entire panel? Now, this is the photo art silk, another paper which I really love. I call this a magic paper because it, it has this very gentle luster, which only comes out after it comes out the printer. So it sort of goes in as a just a normal piece of paper and then it comes out with this gentle luster all over it. It's got a very gentle texture to it. And so for my work, which is quite texturized, it's a perfect paper. And it's also a paper that I can put all my 20 images from my panel on and every single one of them works on that particular paper. So how to choose a paper is very much not only down to the specific image, but how you're going to use it. Now, these images, this two, these two here, this one being quite a delicate portrait works exceptionally well on portrait smooth. And I love that paper, as I said just now. It really is perfect because it's a very delicate picture. However, if we put it on the gallery etching, which is a very pretty coarse and a very nice paper, it's not right for this particular image because the textures of the, of the actual paper itself make her skin look really crabby and horrible, particularly around the neck and, and across here. So you instantly know that that's not the right paper. So if you're looking to keep this skin looking beautiful and smooth, then you've got to put it on the paper that's appropriate for it. So that is another example of right and wrong paper. This one is even more of an example of this. So here we are. And this one is how it should be printed. And that is the gold art silk, the gold silk. What am I putting the word art in there for? I don't know. Gold silk. OK, so it's a toned mono and putting it on this beautiful burrata paper that is gently creamy warm brings out those tones that are in that toned mono. Put it onto a matte paper. And oh dear me, it's nearly died, hasn't it? Just look at the difference between those two images. How it can be so wrong on a different image. We haven't altered the basic file that we've printed from at all, but it's come out totally different. So again, choice of paper is really important. So when I'm actually in the processing mode of that, I know that because I like that particular gold silk paper, I know the result that I'm going to get if I use that as I'm processing it. So I'm thinking about the tone, the tones that I'm putting through here in processing and thinking about how it's going to work on that paper. And finally, we have an image that you've already seen on screen. And this is just a really an example of, am I going to choose the luster that is, this is the oyster paper, and it's a really good paper for everyday printing, perfectly acceptable print that would go up in a camera club and nobody would criticize at all because there's nothing wrong with that paper. However, put it onto portrait white, which is what it's been designed to go on because I, this was where I was aiming when I was processing it. And it just moves that little ooch into being something a little bit more special. And now the assessor, the judge, whoever looks at it and thinks, oh, what a beautiful image. It's been beautifully printed because it's on the right paper. It's on the paper that it was designed to go on. So all these little things that we have to think about can turn your prints into something a little bit more special. And as I say, four papers. And if you've got four papers in, in your collection at home, I would hazard a good guess 
that you, your work will go on one of these four very comfortably. So what I've asked Permajet to do, and they very kindly did for us, was they've done us a special test pack of these four papers, which I recommend to you. So we've got the FB Pearl, which gives high quality, good results for you. And it's a very nice paper to use. They're all lovely papers to use. But the Pearl gives this lovely, just gentle luster to it. The gold silk, which I showed you a moment ago on my Art Nude work, because that has this warm undertone, which for the skins and toned works, work, toned monos, works particularly well. Portrait White, which gives a gentle texture and it's a beautiful art paper to work on. And although I'm using it for portraiture, it works so well across so many genres. So don't feel that, oh, well, that's not for me. That's got the word portrait on it. So it's only for portrait work because that's not the case. I've printed other things on it as well and it works beautifully. It's a lovely white paper for a start. And so therefore you just think about, oh, I've got a bit of a high key image here. So therefore I'm going to use this white, very white paper. And then the magic paper, the photo art silk, um, it's a little bit more textured than the portrait white, but it has this lovely luster on it. And so it, it as I say, it's just a magic paper. It's just fun to use and, and it gives you great results. So having chosen your paper, let's start to look at how you are going to think about the profile. Now, the word profile is like, oh, what do they mean? What do they mean about profile? Well, every paper has a different characteristic and it's almost like it's a slightly different language from one paper to the next. So we've got to understand the profile, the language of that paper, so that we can say to the printer, this is the way we want you to handle this particular piece of paper to get the best results. So we have to learn to how do we read that profile. First of all, you will have gone on to, bought the paper to start with. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> um, then you go on to the Permajet website and you download things called ICC profiles. Personally, I download the whole lot for my printer and I, all I have to do is register on the, on the Permajet website and then you tell them what printer you're using and which ink you're using. Use decent ink, okay? Don't be tempted into the cheap inks. There are some... Um, obviously, the Epsom is perfect for the Epsom machine, etc. Um, and I guess Canon for Canons, etc. And there are some inks, and Permajet do their own inks, that are still good quality inks, and they will save you some money. But whatever ink you're going to be using, you need in that um, work, that when you're, when you're asking Permajet to send you the profiles for the paper, you need to define what ink you're using. So I use the Epsom inks in my Epsom paper, um, sorry, in my Epsom printer. So I tell them that and then I download all the profiles for every paper. You may choose to only download the profiles for the paper that you've just bought. And that's fine as well. Um, but I just like having them all there in case I ever fancy using one of the papers. So let's start looking at the settings in the print software. So you've got your image there and now you've got to work with these profiles which you've put into your computer. Oh, and by the way, it, it, isn't, it isn't difficult. Where you file them in the, the Mac and the, and the PC is different, but all that information comes back to you from Permajet when you take their profiles from them. So Again, there's videos online to show you exactly where to file them to be able to use them properly. So we open up the um, printer, printer software. It will be a little bit different, of course, for Canon, as you would expect. It may even be different for an Epson, one Epson printer to another Epson printer. But wherever these settings are, you have to do the same things in principle. So I will just show you how I do it on my P600 because that's the only example I've got to give you basically. But it isn't 
difficult to work out the similarities between these different loads of software. So one of the first things to do is look at where it says color heading, sorry, color handling heading. <laughs> um, and that must be set on Photoshop manages the colors. Don't let the printer manage it. Otherwise, you are shot at this stage because it, it'll go completely wrong and horrible for you. So that drop down has to be on Photoshop manages color. The next thing we're going to look at is the po paper profile. So I click on the paper profile link and up comes, and these are what I downloaded from Permajet. These are all the different profiles for the different papers. So I find the name quite simply, and I'm, let's say I'm going to produce this portrait on Portrait White. So AJP, APJ even, not JP, APJ is Permajet. So this is how we're going to read this information. The next section tells me OEMI Inc. So I'm using Epsom Inc. And then it's telling me which printer it's going in, SCP600. So that's my printer. It's giving me the name of the paper. And then the magic bit is this little bit on the end, WCRW. And you look at this, you think, what the hell does that mean? Because I certainly did that to start with, but I knew it was significant. So let's see what happens next. So I've, I've ticked that. Let's go back a screen. Now we're going to go into printer settings and I pick up fine art paper and oh, WCRW is watercolor radiant white. Now I can see the link. I can see that those codes that were on that previous page, so if I go back and even if you look at a different one, look, EAM is on the matte papers. PSG is on the glossy papers. So it's telling me here, EAM, Matt, WCRW is going to go on, on, the, on the one that I just showed you or the watercolor one. So it's telling me on this next screen which of these settings I need. So the matte, quite obviously on the matte paper. If we've got a glossy paper, it goes into the glossy, but I'm working on a fine art paper and then I drop down to watercolor paper, radiant white. So the settings are correct. We've got the right profile and that we're telling the printer, this is how you're gonna get a good result. Finally, in, in this setting, it's just worth noting that it actually tells you where in this particular printer setter, setting, and I can't say whether this is the same for others, it does actually tell me if you're using that paper, it tells me to, to load the paper, where I should load the paper, etc. Not sure if all the software does that, but that's just a little bit of help that it gives me on my P600. So at that stage, you're ready to press send. And this is when I get really excited because the print comes through and almost before it's through, I'm starting to... I know this sounds really crazy, but it almost comes out as if it's giving birth to me, to this beautiful piece of paper and my print is on there. And I get quite excited at that stage thinking, yes, it really looks good. It, you know, it, it, I'm going to be proud of this. And then it comes on through that printer, comes out. And yes, you do need to put it aside just to mature a little bit but instantly you can see you've got a good result. And I very, very rarely have to reprint. Okay, occasionally something goes wrong, the printer catches and it comes out at a funny angle at something and it'll go a little bit wrong from that point of view. But if you follow these steps through, nine times out of 10, you get exactly what you want out the end because you've manage the whole process from the point of shoot to the point of printing. And, and it, as I said to you when we started, it isn't difficult. It really isn't. So if you can just put those steps in place, my bet to you is you will come out with prints that you can mount beautifully, frame and exhibit and be proud of. And I think that is the ultimate for all of us as, as photographers to see the work in that way. 
What makes a good uh, makes a good printer is diligence, and that I think Lee has really nailed. Attention to personal interpretation and the artistic and creative feel to a finished print. So as I said to you, when I'm producing my my work, when I'm in doing a little bit of manipulation or controlling just controlling the histogram or whatever the levels are that I'm trying to manage, I'm already looking at that image and I'm deciding what type of paper it's going to go on. So for me, because I use textures a lot, the texture will quite often determine which how textured I want that image to be, which textured paper I will going to go on. If it's an art nude and I'm doing it on tone paper, I'm thinking again, I want these warm tones. So all the time I'm working on it, it's aiming to become a print. And that way you really will get some good work coming out the other end. So to help you, we have an offer, uh, a second offer today, um, because I think that we can help you a little bit more to get the prints how you want them to be. Because quite often when we, we're not... Um, as confident with our printing as we, as I hope you will become, you look at it and you know that it's not quite right, but you can't identify why. So what we're going to do is my friend and guru, Lee, is going to analyse 20 images. So the first 20 people to send work in to Permajet, Lee will take and he will analyse it and you'll get a report back. He needs a little bit of information from you because obviously he needs something to start with. So we're going to be asking you to send in some things to us. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Lee and I'm going to let him explain that for himself because I think it's better coming from him than me. Hi, it's Lee Preston here. Um, some of you may well know me from the lecture circuit or have uh, been involved in various seminars and things that I've uh, been at and what have you. You may know me as a, a Permajet printer and um, I'm here to offer you some help with a noble art of printing your own pictures. And the reason I'm doing this is so they can look as good as you want them to. Janet Haynes and myself through Permajet are offering what can loosely be called a print clinic. Printing is really the end result of your vision and your expression. Photography is simply, you know, if you take it in very simple terms, it's divided into two stages, really. There's the taking stage, all the art that you need and the knowledge that you need of taking the picture with your camera and the, the aspects uh, about that. But then you've got to make the picture. You've got to try and revisit how you felt in that location or in that situation and make that work as a print. Ideally, um, it works as a projected image as well, but we're here to talk about printing. Now, I've been printing my work for 40 years. In fact, I started off as a, a darkroom printer, uh, and that's given me quite a, a, a long um, level of experience, if you like, and an insight into all the things that can go wrong when you're printing. I've run quite a number of courses, um, a lot for Permajet, and prior to that, I worked for the Jessup School of Photography. Um, that was in Leicester. And I still teach photography at college uh, and I still run workshops. I, I don't do as many lectures these days, but I, I still do the few. So um, that experience perhaps allows me to uh, look at your work uh, and make some suggestions. So what I'm able to offer uh, is simply by you submitting a print uh, at A4 size with its corresponding file, I'll analyse it. And I'll offer some suggestions as to what paper surface it might look best on. And alongside that, I'll give you some technical suggestions about recording tonal range, about colour interpretation, and about how you deal with some of those niggles that crop up. Maybe you've got blemishes, small errors, banding, and concerns that have caused your print to look less than satisfactory and less like the picture that you originally envisaged when you took it. Um, I will emphasise that this is not a critique. 
And in no way is it a judgment on your work or the style you're working in or the subject matter in your picture. It's, no, it's not in any way a form of criticism. It's just meant as guidance and suggestion, but also to, to aid motivation, if you like. The idea really is to give you uh, the confidence in making your own prints on the right surface with the right choices of how you deal with things like color management and how you set yourself up to make those prints and how they will look much better if you print them with the ideal medium. So that's all I'm here to do. And I really look forward to seeing the work. Um, now I'm retired, I've got plenty of time to look at this, so I shall really enjoy it. Thanks very much for your participation. Okay, so thanks Lee for that. I really appreciate you sp supporting me today with this talk. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're going to invite you, the audience, to ask us questions. And to do that, we want you to use the Zoom chat. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, the little icons pop up and you'll see the chat box. If you're on a tablet, I think they come down from the top then. Um, so in that chat, you type in your question and somebody will read it out for us to answer. What I would ask though, is please don't just, just ask questions. We don't need the feedback at this stage because otherwise the questions get lost in amongst all the other things that are coming in. So keep that chat simply for questions and we'll do our very best to answer them for you. So thanks for now and let's take the questions. Hi both, can you hear me okay? Yes, I'm here. How about you, Lee? Yes. Lee, you're on, on mute. Perhaps you'd like to come on that. Yep. Okay, yeah. I can hear you now. Okay. Now, one of the things that I've just realised is I said, please use the chat. But in fact, because we're using Zoom webinar tonight, we've got an actual Q&A um, place. So if you could ask questions in the Q&A, that way we can keep a good monitor of just one place rather than trying to look at chat and monitor. So uh, a few questions have come in on the chat while we've been um, running the actual talk itself. And um, let me just pick a couple of those up before we get on to the, the Q&As that are coming in now. Um, one question was about paper for landscape work, Lee. Now, my feeling is that the same analysis goes on, whether it's a portrait or whether it's a landscape, the picture almost determines which paper that you use. If you want, if it's a seascape and you want it sparkly, you're going to be choosing a glossier paper. Whereas if your landscape is very textural, maybe you might want to put it on a textured paper. What do you think about landscapes, Lee? Because it's not my speciality. Um, depends how much clout you want. And let's, let's divide it into two um, very easy um, demarcation lines there. If it's a mono landscape, you'll probably want to think about, are you going to make this as a, a heavy, darker, moody scene? Or if it's a very delicate and soft pastel landscape, such as a snow scene or um, one which is um, almost infrared in, in look, then you're going to want to use uh, a softer paper, one which is more delicate to, to portray that. Um, if you are looking to make some impactful um, colour landscapes, then sometimes you need them to shine and you need them to shout a bit. So you're going to be looking at the, the glossier papers or, or the ones that are, are slightly lustered. But if you are, again, using something like flower photography within the landscape, a very delicate or even a very artistic scene, like some people um, do enjoy, um, you know, the, the traditional landscape, then it might look very nice uh, on one of the softer papers. So really the answer is it doesn't matter what the genre is, the image itself more or less tells you which paper it needs to go on is the answer. But if you've got a specific specific type of work that you do, then find that paper that works for you. Um, it, it, that also answered in part another one of the questions, Lee, which was about um, infrared images, which papers to use. You did touch on it there. Um, I guess really it depends again on what the infrared image is telling you as to which paper you might choose as well. Well, this again is um, how you want that final picture to look. Uh, a lot of infrared images do have this traditional look to them whereby um, you've got very glowing foliage 
and a really rich um, dark blue in the sky, um, similar to how you used to get them in the dark room when you used a red filter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you might like to use a harsher paper on those. But on the other hand, if you're using, um, you know, a delicate infrared, which again contains things like grasses uh, and leaf patterns and isn't um, a wide ranging landscape, but one which is perhaps um, closer to a more intimate landscape, then again, you might like to think about how that's going to be represented. Now, the simple answer um, in many cases to these simple questions is to test it out on pictures on paper, um, which are at opposite ends uh, of what we produce. So try it on art paper, and if it doesn't look too good, then try it on a, a, a glossier surface. And the way to do that is to um, grab yourself one of our test packs, um, which are you know, uh, an incredible um, tool really for the printer who is just beginning to understand papers. Uh, but I would give you an advice if you if you do buy a test pack, then make sure you write on the back of each sheet that's in there what that particular paper is, because otherwise you might get them mixed up and you can't find the right profile to suit the paper. Um, so um, that's what that would be. Uh, you know, it's a bit of a long winded answer, but um, it is it is one that's very pertinent at this time if you're just learning to print. That test pack caught me out the first time I had one. I took one from the middle of the pack and then. From then after, I didn't know which papers I was printing on. So just a gentle paper, just a gentle, soft um, pencil on the back. Write what they are before you get started, because the, the, it will tell you what order they are in and it will tell you you've got three of each. But as I say, you can very quickly get them all in the muddle. So another question that came in while we were talking before we go on to the actual Q&As was about soft proofing, Lee. And I know we discussed that we hadn't put that um, in earlier. And so perhaps we should cover soft proofing just a little bit now. OK, um, soft proofing, we're beginning to uh, get a little bit more technical when we start talking about how we're doing um, our proofing. Now, um, there are two ways, obviously, to, to, to proof your picture. One is to literally uh, work through your workflow, uh, get to the point where you're you profiled your your you know your setup to, to make the print and literally uh, see what comes out of your printer on an A4 test sheet, you know just literally test make a test print like we used to do in the darkroom. The other way, if you feel that you'd like to be a little bit more in control, is to go into the proof setup on the uh, on the menu bar. Um, you'll have to look at um, the, the where, where that is. We, I can't demonstrate that in this, uh, on this particular evening. And make sure that you then attach uh, the actual profile uh, of the paper you're using into that so that you can see the difference on the screen. Now, soft proofing often requires you to put two, um, if you like, um, separate images side by side on the screen so you can see the original and then you can see the one that you've proved so you can compare the two so that's relatively straightforward to do as well and then the thing to remember in all this is to make sure that photoshop is managing the colors because otherwise it's all going to come out in a slightly different hue you might end up with something that's too red why do we soft proof? We soft proof because we want to know what the paper is going to um, receive from our, you know, laptop or our, our um, you know, our PC or our, you know, Mac. We want to know roughly what it's going to look like as a print. And you can sort of ape that on screen. It will never be an absolute comparison. What we're doing really is with a screen, you get this um, transmission of light. But with a print, of course, it just reflects light. Uh, and one will have a lot more luminosity than the other. And the screen will obviously look better. And Janet's already touched on that. One thing you must do is turn the, um, if you like, the brightness down on your screen, because otherwise you're going to get a false identity in your work. And then if you do your soft proofing, um, it will at least give you an opportunity to see how much more contrast you need to build in, how much more saturation you might need to build in, uh, and whether you need to adjust your blacks and your whites. Even if it's a colour image, 
you still need to think about the density of the blacks and the whites within that image. It'll also give you a chance to see the paper base color, if you like, in a way, because a lot of papers are warmer um, than others, which means that you're gonna get a slightly different look to the picture. So that's, that's one way of assessing a, a, a print on screen before you print it. Okay, we've got 29 Q and A's to get through. Okay. So Abby, Charlie, would you like to talk us through these and perhaps some of them can be combined. Um, I can see there's something about ICC profiles, for example. Yes, yeah, thank, you, thank you um, both for that. Um, the first question I've come through is from Ian, who has asked if there is a significant visual difference between uh, custom profiles and bespoke profiles. Um, if so, how would you go about getting hold of a bespoke profile? Okay, what I what both Lee and I recommend is that we find the generic profiles really work very well indeed. I very, very rarely go for a custom profile. However, just occasionally, there'll be an odd paper that, that isn't quite working. And at that stage, I would do a custom profile just for that one, for that one type of paper. Um, as I say, I don't have a problem with the generics. Custom profiles are easy to do, um, and Permajet will do them for, for you for free if you've bought the paper from them. Um, but they're not always that necessary. I think people get a bit hung up on them personally. Do you agree, Lee? Uh, I do. What you really want to do, I mean, it depends on what stage you are at in your printing abilities and your experience. Um, start with the generics. And then if you are getting a consistent um, problem with matching your picture to the paper, then is a good idea to have a custom profile made uh, for that paper that you're using. I, I have a custom profile made for Oyster, for instance, because it comes out too dark if I print it with a generic profile. But everybody's monitors are different and everybody's printer will respond in a slightly different way. Um, it's in the same way as everybody's eyesight's different. And it also depends on how you've set your room up. Um, if you're not looking at your prints in um, daylight, um, and I don't mean going over to the window to look at because daylight outside changes. Uh, it changes from blue to red through the day. So I would suggest you buy yourself a daylight uh, lamp that Janet's just showing you one there and you can look at your prints underneath that. I have a daylight um, bulb in, in the ceiling um, in, in my workroom. My workroom is also neutral and I don't sit in, if I'm calibrating the screen, um, I don't sit in front of it with um, anything other than a muted grey colour on. Um, if you calibrate it with a with a with red or you've got red curtains, then that's going to affect your calibration as well. So um, just bear in mind what Janet said earlier on, make your prints in a standard way. Set your room up exactly the same each time. Uh, consistency is, 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 a, is a real uh, bonus here. OK, thanks, ladies. Um, we've got a question from Ian on does a stock ICC profile for a given printer vary by time, i.e. the stock is better? Uh, average ICC profile is improved. I'm not sure about that last bit there. OK, so what he's saying, if you, I would think, is if you download it, let's say, in 2018, do you have to renew it again in 2020? Does it change? Hmm. I've never thought about that. Have you, Lee? How can it? It's numbers. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I've just I've had my profiles in my computer for ages. If the paper manufacturer changes, yeah, we change the profile, and and Permajet would obviously tell you that there's a new mm. version of that paper out. But um, it's a series of numbers, and um, just literally uh, from one end of the the number to to the other. I mean, um, we won't go into eight bit and sixteen bit files, but that's how these numbers are generated. Uh, and obviously, if you're working from a raw file, you've got a lot more numbers that can be slightly adjusted to give you a much purer picture. Um, but no, they don't change. And shelf life is another thing that's come up as well. But, you know, again, I've had paper on the shelf for a long time and I don't get any different results from it. It, it depends on the pressure that uh, is in the paper. If you've got 100 sheets in a box, then the sheets at the bottom may be a little bit more pressurised and there might be slight degradation in that. And it depends on the temperature of the room that you're keeping it in. You know, 
Uh, but you don't need to keep them in the fridge or anything like this. Not like you used to darkroom papers. <laughs> well, as I say, I keep mine quite happily in their boxes of 25. And I don't have a problem with that. So uh, how you store it is, is the answer there, really. Yeah, don't store it vertically. No. I, one of the things I tend to do is I, t I tend to store mine with the, book, with the boxes upside down because then you don't get any curl when it goes through the printer. Um, I don't know if that, you know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's what I do. Well, one of the papers we produce has got no curl at all, you know. Um, yeah, true. Gold, gold silk is wonderful for that. Yes. It's, it's a perfectly flat paper. Yeah. Abby, jolly. Um, so I have a question here where someone's asking, where can I see and feel different papers? <laughs> okay. I have. Whoa. This is the trouble with Zoom. You've got to get it at the same, same depth of field as you look. I have here, if I can get it into shot. Yes, there we go. The swatch that is produced by Permajet, which has all their papers in it. And this means you literally can have a look at exactly what they look like in reality. So, you know, I can show you here now, but you can see that these ones down here on Zoom are looking very purpley on Zoom, but they're not really. Um, so send for one of these, get hold of a uh, phone Permajet or email Permajet, get hold of one of these and then you can feel the weight see the quality of it and look at the print the, the uh, various textures etc that you want and it really does help you to choose which image which photo which paper you want for your photo so yeah. i recommend those oh look you have one of these a test back sorry look back <laughs> to front if you if you have a test back you get a swatch in there we used to get a swatch in the test back. yeah that's true um, i'm not certain whether they still do that because it's a while since i've had a test back Okay, the, certainly the special offer test pack that is coming uh, with the four recommended papers to you today won't have a swatch in it, but no doubt if you ask for a swatch, they will send one with it for you. Is that right, Charlie Abbey? That's right, yeah. Yeah, bro. Thank you. Next question. Um, so we've got a question from Ian, which is, do you need to produce a customised ICC profile via Permager each time you calibrate your monitor? No. Quick, easy answer. No. Too, too much, you know. If you change ink sets, yes. Yeah, true. You know, if you change to a different ink, and certainly if you change um, to a different printer, if you, mm. you know, you'll need to do that again. Um, but no, you don't need to do that. Not for calibration. Mm. Next one. So I've got a question here from Susan, who's asked, when calibrating an iMac, what luminance value um, would you recommend? <laughs> okay. Hmm. I can't remember what mine's at, to be honest. I've got it set and I do the same thing every time. I don't have a Mac, so mine's um, not, not set up that way. But um, it might be a question you can refer back to um, Colin at uh, Permajet. OK. Yeah, I can. Um, what I can do is I can, um, any of these questions we're not able to answer, uh, I can kind of, I can write them down and get a couple of answers from um, the team at Permajet and I can send those out uh, in a follow-up email in a couple of okay, days. Okay, brilliant. Time. Thanks, Charlie. That's a brilliant answer. Next question. Okay, so we've got a question. Can you recommend a good home A3 printer, please? <laughs> I, I didn't a, hear home? a good home. I, I, I think it means um, one for use at home rather than you know, mine's a good home if anybody wants to send me one. <laughs> um, I, I personally love my P, my Epson P60, six, P600. It's an A3+. Plus. Um, it doesn't take up, it take, it's a moderate size, but it isn't enormous. And I just get such great results out of it. So, you know, at the moment, I'm very happy with that one. And it's all very difficult for you to say, can you recommend? Because... We've got what we've got sitting on our desks. We're not trying hundreds of printers. Um, so, you know, there might be a better one out there, but for me, my P600 is just perfect. Well, I use a, a, an Epson 3880, um, which is a little long in the tooth now, but it gives me good results. Uh, and it will be replaced um, at some time um, in the next year or so. Uh, because um, I don't want, I, I, I always want to be printing and I don't want to be finding myself without a printer. 
um, and I might go for a, a, a bigger one that can can do a one size prints then. But uh, in the main, a P six hundred or the the, the Canon um, the Canon three hundred um, has got a good reputation, even though it only has two blacks. Um, but um, you know, I noticed there was a question about a Canon one hundred. I've not used one of those, but um, the three hundred, as far as I, uh, I can ascertain from the prints that my wife gets on it, um, it is fine. Okay. Thanks, ladies. So uh, the next question I have is from Stephen, who has asked, he, well, he does a lot of monochrome printing. Um, could you recommend a paper for monochrome printing? Well, we sort of covered that just now a little bit, didn't we, really? Saying that, again, it, it, it really depends on how you're producing that monochrome and whether it's a heavy, um, dynamic sort of monochrome or whether you're going for the lighter, lighter things. The same principles apply, really, um, with whatever image you're working, it, the, the image tells you what to use rather than you determining I'm going to use a, I don't know, a distinction paper, for example. Um, or if you really want to use a distinction paper, then process appropriately for that particular paper. Do it re reverse, reverse it if you must. But it's uh, normally for me, the print itself determines what I'm going to print it on. It's similar for me, but if you're really stuck and, and a good uh, paper for a good range of monochrome printing is gold silk. Mm -hmm. So um, you might start with that. Again, it's a brighter paper, um, so it's a nice heavy paper uh, and it'll give you a very good tonal range. Providing you, you know, you tell it that you need to tell the <laughs> tell the paper. Um, it's a bit like anything else, you know. It, it, computers will give you the answers, providing you feed them the right questions. Um, but you need to be able to do that. So, uh, if you're in one of those people that's going to send a picture uh, in for analysis, then uh, you'll get some answers on that one certainly. There's another one relating to the papers here: a good matte paper for printing deep blacks. Or is it more dependent on the on the printer inks? Is there a good matte paper? Well, I like that. I like the the um, Barata matte personally. It's quite one of my favourite papers. Um, but then my work isn't that deep black. So, is there a one that you would think would work well on deep black sleeve? I don't use. Um, I don't print uh, my black and white pictures on matte paper. Mm. Um, but that's just because that's the style of picture that I make. Most of you know me for some pretty hefty industrial landscapes or um, sort of very dark uh, landscapes in the mountains and things like that. But again, um, there's nothing wrong with a variety of mat. You just have to be a little bit careful that you can retain some information in the blacks when you're using a matte paper. I'm not a, one of these people that says you can't have a straight black. Um, a lot of judges in camera clubs insist on having information in both black and white. Um, that, you know, I don't know where that came from, but as far as I'm concerned, it's utterly wrong. If you want, a, a, you know, an area that's dense black and an area that's pure paper white, that's your choice. Mm. Not some judge who comes along and tells you that, that this is all wrong. Um, and it depends on the picture, of course. Yeah. If you're making a high key picture with just a strand of grasses in it or a fence um, in almost silhouette, then obviously you need paper-based white with that. But uh, yes, I, I, I would struggle printing my work on that paper. Okay, Abby, Charlie. Okay, so we've got a question from David, which is, I'm a novice printer and I struggle with sizing images prior to printing. I get borders, which I don't expect. Please help. Hmm. Okay, any ideas there? You get borders. Um, is he printing on a Canon printer? Because I think some Canon printers used to introduce a border if it hadn't been set up right. But again, I've not got the um, experience of that. It's never happened to me. Um, that may be a question that we can refer back to the team at Permajet. But um, you could find that you've not resized or something like that. Or you could try resizing your picture a little bit, or you could try cropping it down and see if the border still occurs after you've done that. Um, have a quick look at the, the size that you're printing at as well. Have you got the DPI right? Um, and, and things like that. So there's, there's odd little areas which you just need to look through and make sure you're being consistent with your workflow. And that, that means going right the way down the list and making sure everything is uh, worked out as 
as per you've learned or you've been told. And if you haven't got that information, um, that's the sort of thing that you do pick up by talking to, to other people who are printing and talking to us as well. David could even um, be one of your 20 people. He could be, you will, yes. You, you might yeah. analyse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one, please. So I have an anonymous question come through here. Um, pigment or dye inks, benefits and drawbacks? Uh, mine takes whatever it takes and that's it, you know? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, there's all sorts of different things that go on. Some people swear by one or the other. Um, whatever your printer is, is accepting. I mean, some people have still got printers that have got ink systems in them. Um, so obviously you'll have to go with whatever the manufacturer gives you on those. Um, and if, if your picture, if you're printing with dye inks and they're coming out in colors that you um, don't think are right, then, uh, and you've always got right colors when you've used pigment inks, then obviously that's where you need to be working. Um, I haven't got the, the total answer to that. Sorry, it sounds as though we're, we're, we're fobbing you off here. But um, no, my, I'm, I'm just using uh, an, an Epson ink set with my Epson printer. Yep, me too. Ladies? We've got another anonymous question, which is they always say you have to sharpen your picture just before printing. Are you really convinced not to do that? <laughs> Personally, never. <laughs> never ever do that um i i don't like sharpening as i said in the talk um for me i don't think it's necessary we've got good cameras we've got good lenses and if we're shooting and getting things sharp at the point of shooting why do you need to sharpen um you're only going to use artifacts yeah i have a slightly different take on that uh, first of all you should turn off any sharpening in the camera you know, if your your camera will be set up, um, you don't want anything in there that is going to alter your RAW file or alter your JPEG if you're shooting in JPEG. And then if you are printing, um, when you analyze, when you, I always use a RAW file converter to start my print. I don't go straight into Photoshop. I always do a lot of work in, uh, you know, maybe subtle work, but in the RAW file converter. Mm -hmm. And there is a, um, preset for sharpening and you want to take that out straight away it's usually set for 40 40 percent take it out you don't need it if you then need to apply some sort of sharpening because you want a picture that's edgy and again my work is different to janet's janet's um there's a lot of soft and subtle work and some of mine has is rather brutal so i might apply something like 80 or 100 points of sharpening to um an architectural image or something like that. And that will be one of the last things I do in Photoshop. And I might use the high pass filter or I might just use, um, you know, the, 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 the various sharpening methods that come up on the screen. But don't over sharpen whatever you do. It shows up. What sharpening does is it looks for an edge and it looks for trying to find the difference between the pixels. And if it can find that, and if you're not careful, you'll end up with a white halo around some of the black um, parts of your picture. Yep. It is interesting, isn't it? Because our, our work is so vastly different um, and I like the softness. So uh, <laughs> sharpening is true. Go out the window, sharpener. <laughs> OK, ladies. What I thought I'd do is ask a couple more um, questions for you guys here and then anything that we haven't answered. Um, I'll take a note of it down and then I can make sure that we can get the Permajet team to answer that. Yeah, you can send okay. it to me as well. I can answer some. Great, thank you. Um, so I have a question here. Do you prefer Photoshop to Lightroom for printing? Well, I only have Photoshop. I'm not a Lightroom person at all. So for me, I, I print from Photoshop into the, into the Epson print software. I'll come at it from a slightly different angle again. Um, the raw file converter is almost identical to Lightroom. So what you're doing in Lightroom and what you're doing in the raw file converter, you've got the same set of sliders and you've got the same set of instructions and, and if you like, areas to follow. Um, so yes, in a way, I'm using both. Um, 
Elements um, at one time was a, was a smaller package and perfectly adequate for what most photographers need. The trouble with Photoshop, it was designed for graphic designers. Mm. Uh, there's no way that we need, or oh, even a tiny 10% of, of what's available in there. And whatever you do, don't be tempted to keep going down the filter drawer and applying gimmicks and artifacts and all sorts to your, to your work. It doesn't need it. <laughs> uh, so you see, there's no one answer because uh, we're all different. So there's nothing that's right and nothing that's wrong. It's what's right for you that works. Ladies? So we'll take one more question, um, which actually I can answer, which is, will this recording be available to watch again, please? And yes, we are recording it and we will be sending out a link for you tomorrow so you can all watch it again. Okay. So we thank you very much for being with us this evening. And I hope that you feel now that you can enjoy printing. We want you to enjoy printing. So do take advantage of Lee's offer for his print clinic. Um, I think maybe I'll send one in anonymous to see what happens. <laughs> and then um, we hope to see you again sometime. But do do keep talking to us. And I'm sure if you have got printing problems or paper problems, et cetera, we can all help you. So thanks again and bye for now. Yeah, thanks very much and uh, cheerio. And um, we'll see you sometime out on the circuit, I'm sure. And thanks to Permajet for sponsoring this for me and for Lee for joining me tonight because uh, without him, I'd have been a bit lost. With <laughs> I don't so. know about being a guru, but... Um, you you know. are a guru. <laughs> I just happen right. to have been doing this for a long time. Exactly. Okay. Anyway, okay. Good, good luck to everybody with your printing. Um, printing tomorrow, please. That would be a good start. Okay. Thanks then. Bye, Thank everyone.